Unlock in the Bible by David Pawson, Zechariah. Introduction. The book of Zechariah has a great number of similarities with Haggai. Indeed, Zechariah chapter 8 could easily have come from the earlier prophet's mouth. This is not surprising, because Haggai and Zechariah overlap by one month, with Zechariah beginning exactly where Haggai left off. From the outset, we must note that if Haggai is one of the easiest of the minor prophets to understand, then Zechariah is one of the hardest. There are three main differences to point out. Number one, Zechariah was later than Haggai and continued his prophecy for much longer. It was like a relay race, as if Haggai passed the baton to Zechariah, who then ran with it, but ran very much further. Number two, the book of Zechariah is much longer than Haggai. In our Bible it has 12 chapters instead of just a couple. Number 3. Zechariah looked into the far distant future while Haggai dealt with the present and its immediate problems. Zechariah seemed to be able to look to the end of time. Some of his more immediate future predictions are mixed with some of his very distant future predictions which leaves us in confusion as to the time period that is being considered. Also, there is a lot more poetry in Zechariah's than Haggai. His style is markedly different in places. It is what we call an apocalyptic book. Apocalyptic prophecies are a strongly visual form of communication, full of symbols and weird pictures. Animals and angels tend to be especially prominent, with the latter involved in explaining the pictures to people. This is reminiscent of the book of Revelation, the second half of Daniel and a few parts of Ezekiel. The reason why the prophecy is in this strange form is very simple. It is very difficult to imagine the distant future. You can imagine the near future quite easily, because it is just the present trends continuing. But the distant future is much more difficult. After all, how would you describe life today to somebody living a thousand years ago? A description of television would sound extraordinary. They would have little or no understanding. The only way you can describe the distant future to people is to try and give it in the form of a picture or a symbol, and then explain the symbol to them. So Zechariah is a very different kind of prophecy. We understand the message of Haggai very easily. He tells the people to finish the temple and God will bless them. Who needs any explanation of that? But Zechariah is a very different proposition. The prophet. His name means God remembers. It is a very common name in the Old Testament belonging to some 29 people. He was a priest, so here is a priest who is also a prophet, though this is not especially surprising, because around two out of every fifteen of the people who returned from Babylon were priests. It was a religious return, for the people came back to re-establish God's name in Jerusalem. They certainly didn't come back because the land was going to be more fertile, or because trading would be better, for life in Babylon was much better. They returned for spiritual reasons so a high number of priests returned. There are two extraordinary developments which Zechariah highlights. The first is that priests would replace prophets as the spiritual leaders of the community. For the next 400 years there would be no prophets, just priests. So Zechariah being a priest and a prophet marks a kind of transition. Indeed, he predicts that there will come a day when nobody will want to claim to be a prophet. The second startling development is that the priests are going to take over from the kings as leaders. Zechariah made a crown of silver and gold to put on the head, not of Zerubbabel, but Joshua the priest. For the first time in Israel's history, the office of priest and king would be united. This has had happened only once before in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, when a man called Melchizedek, who was the king of Jerusalem, was a priest as well. But this was long before the birth of Israel as a nation. 
we know from the New Testament that this is the line from which Jesus came, comes. He is from the order of Melchizedek, not Eli. He is a priest, a king and a prophet. So Zechariah marks a kind of fusing of these three positions of leadership. The priest takes over from the prophet and the priest takes over from the king. By the time Jesus came there were only priests. John the Baptist was the first prophet they would get after 400 years, but the rulers were two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. So Zechariah is a very significant book in marking this transition. There is an easy way of dividing the different periods of leadership in the history of Israel. If you take the 2,000 years of Israel's history from Abraham to Jesus, you can divide them very neatly into four periods of 500 years. During the first 500 years from 2000 to 1500 BC, they were led by patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. During the next 500 years from 1500 to 1000 BC, they were led by prophets, Moses to Samuel. From 1000 to 500 BC, they were led by kings or princes. But from 500 BC to the coming of Jesus, priests led them. So God had given them a sample of every kind of leadership. Each kind of leadership failed Israel. What they really needed was one leader who would combine all these offices in one, which is of course what they got with Jesus. An outline of the book. Present Problems Chapters 1 to 8 Carefully Dated All Prose Rebuke and Rebellion Chapter 1 Encouragement and Enthronement Chapters 1 to 6 Four Horsemen Among Myrtle Trees Four Horns and Four Craftsmen A Man with a Measuring Line The Cleansing of Joshua A Golden Lampstand and Two Olive Trees A Flying Scroll a woman in a basket, four chariots, fasting and feasting chapters 7 to 8, future predictions chapters 9 to 14, undated some poetry, national chapters 9 to 11, vanquished enemies, a peaceful king, a mighty god, a gathered people, deforested neighbours, worthless shepherds, International chapters 12 to 14, an invaded army, grieving inhabitants, banished prophets, reduced population, plagued attackers and universal worship. The book divides into two parts. He received the word from God in pictures, and so that is how he passed it on. But the whole of chapters 1 to 8 are concerned with the situation as it is now. And that is why, like Haggai, he dated his three prophecies. The first prophecy doesn't include the day, but does give us a month and the year. The next was three months later, and the third two years after that. It is not clear why Haggai stopped prophesying, or why God sent someone else to carry on. Maybe Haggai died or was taken ill and couldn't continue. Zechariah simply took over just a month before Haggai finished. Present Problems Chapters 1 to 8 Rebuke and Rebellion The prophecy is given as they are still building the temple. Although it is not finished yet, they have at least listened to Haggai. The one striking thing about the prophets who came after the exile is that the people listened to them and did what they told them. I am sure this is partly due to their being away from home for 70 years. Indeed, Zechariah began with quite a pointed sermon. He reminded them that it was precisely because their forefathers wouldn't listen to the prophets that the exile happened. It was a very timely reminder. It is a very simple sermon. Their forefathers not only knew they were doing wrong, but were told they were doing wrong. They had no excuse whatever. So, said Zechariah, don't make the same mistake. If you don't do what Haggai has told you, you will be in trouble too. 
encouragement and enthronement. Then Zechariah stopped preaching for three months and began again using a very unusual sort of approach. He gave them eight pictures which had all come to him in the night as visions. The simple difference between a vision and a dream is that you are awake when you see a vision and asleep when you dream a dream. These visions came during the night and we are told that God had to keep waking him up to give him the next one. So on this occasion, God preferred to use visions rather than dreams, even though they were given at night. The eight visions seem quite unconnected with each other, but are generally addressed to the rebuilding of the temple, especially the first two. As we look at these cryptic pictures, there is a particular refrain which comes four times. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Zechariah is saying that the test of a prophet is whether what he says happens. One of the laws of Moses stated that if a prophet says something is going to happen and it doesn't, you should stone the prophet for he is false. This should make anyone hesitate before they make a prediction about the future. Fortunately, we are not under the law of Moses, but we do have false prophets around and it's very important that they are tested. If their predictions do not come true and it doesn't happen, they should be rebuked for misleading the people and misusing God's name. Four Horsemen Among Myrtle Trees Chapter 1, verse 7 to 17 There were two red horses, one brown and one white, each with riders on them. According to the angel, they are God's press reporters, messengers of God who ride through the earth and report back to God and tell him what is happening. If it had been a vision today, they would doubtless have been on motorbikes. They report that there is peace in every part of the world, which was precisely the situation after Cyrus had defeated Babylon. For Cyrus was a man of peace, and the whole earth knew peace during his reign. Zechariah is telling the people to take the opportunity of peace to rebuild Jerusalem and complete the temple. Indeed, it was not long afterward that they were invaded by Egyptians, Syrians, Greeks and Romans. God also adds that he is angry with those who took his people away and treated them badly. He was angry with his own people for 70 years, but now he is angry with the people who treated them so disgracefully. But for now, there is going to be this time of peace, when God doesn't send war to any nation. Four Horns and Four Craftsmen, Chapter 1, Verse 18 to 21 Zechariah must have had some farming background, for there are many agricultural pictures here. Here he sees four craftsmen or blacksmiths de horning. Throughout apocalyptic prophecy, a horn is a symbol of the strength of an army. A horn is an aggressive weapon, and therefore he is now seeing a picture of dehorning going on in the four corners of the earth. God is dehorning the aggressors. Babylon is no longer a threat, and soon God will dehorn other nations that have threatened Judah though it is not clear which they are. They can get on with building the temple and put all their resources into that, rather than worrying about imminent attack. A Man with a Measuring Line Chapter 2, 1-13 to The attention shifts to the city of Jerusalem, where he sees a man measuring out the walls. Zechariah realises that the city is going to be far too soon and that eventually it will outgrow the walls. Jeremiah had predicted this and it is a fascinating prophecy. I have a series of maps of Jerusalem through the ages from when it was the little city of David showing how it expanded and stretched. Jeremiah has accurately predicted the extension of the city both the direction and where the suburbs would be. Now, of course, the problem with a rapidly expanding city is, how do you defend it? As soon as you make walls, 
the space inside the walls gets more and more crowded. The man with the measuring line said, it is going to be too small for all the people who will come and live here. Then there is a lovely promise given. God says, I will be the wall. You won't need a wall when the city expands. I will defend it. In part, this vision is intended to be an encouragement to other Jews to return from Babylon, especially if their reluctance to move is because they believe that Jerusalem is not safe. There are two predictions about Gentile nations here. Number one, those who attack Israel will have to face God. There is a lovely phrase. God says, whoever touches my people touches the apple of my eye. The apple of the eye is the iris, the middle part that looks just like an apple on end with a stalk in the middle. It is the most sensitive part of your body, and as soon as even a speck of dust touches it, your eyelid slams down. Jesus himself used the saying, As much as you have done it to the least of these my brethren, you do it to me. It is the same principle. God's people are the most sensitive part of God. Number two, many of the Gentiles will become part of Israel. See chapters 12 to 14. History has proved that the God of Israel exists. The history of the Jewish people is proof. Whoever has dared to attack Israel pays for it later. And yet people from other nations have joined Israel and have been grafted into their olive tree. Both the judgment on the nations harming Israel and the incorporation of nations into Israel show that the God of Israel is a universal God of all peoples. The Cleansing of Joshua, chapter 3, 1 to 10. The next vision concerns Joshua's change of clothes. Zechariah is now looking at the leadership of Zerubbabel and the priest Joshua. What is going to happen now? The first thing is that Satan comes into the picture. Interestingly, the devil hardly ever appears in the Old Testament. He appears in Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden, at the end of Chronicles, when he tempted David to number Israel, and in the early chapters of Job. Of course, he is behind a lot of things, but he becomes far more prominent when Jesus arrives. But he does appear here. Whenever something really significant is going to happen, the devil tries to stop it. He tried to kill every male Jew in Egypt so that Moses would not survive and the people would never get out of Egypt. He killed all the babies at Bethlehem when Jesus was born because he didn't want that baby to grow up and rescue God's people. On this occasion he says that Judah cannot have Joshua to lead them because he is a dirty man having shared in Judah's past sins. Zechariah saw Joshua standing in filthy clothes and realised that the devil was right. The devil does seem to have the function of the counsel for the prosecution in heaven. In Job, he is there in heaven in the counsel of God accusing the people. In the vision, Zechariah hears that Joshua is like a brand, plucked from the burning like a half-burnt stick pulled out of the fire. So they take the dirty clothes off Joshua and clothe him in clean ones with a clean turban on his head. It is a beautiful picture, for he saw that by God's grace, Joshua, in spite of having shed in the sins of his people earlier, was now clean in God's sight, and could be the priest, though he would need to keep clean. God promises that what he had done for this one Jew, he would one day do for the whole nation. He said he would remove the sin of this land in a single day. God can clean a person up and make him a priest. He also promises that in that day, each person will invite his neighbour to sit under his vine. These words foreshadow Jesus finding Nathanael and telling him that he saw him under his fig tree. A golden lampstand and two olive trees, chapter 4, 1 to 14. Next, Zechariah is awoken to see a seven-branched golden lampstand in the temple. He also sees a vessel higher than the lamp, with a tube running down into the lamp, 
and realises that the vessel is full of oil and that nobody will ever need to replenish the oil in the lamp because there is a reservoir of oil flowing through the lampstand. This symbolises Zerubbabel as someone who has a reservoir of the Holy Spirit pouring through him. Oil is always a symbol of God's Holy Spirit in the Bible. This is why the word anointing is used when the Holy Spirit comes on someone, anointing with oil. The Queen of Great Britain was anointed with oil when she was crowned in 1952. So Zerubbabel is God's anointed, and the word for anointed in Hebrew is Messiah. God's anointed one, Christ in the Greek language. But then comes a text that has been quoted by so many. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In context, this means not by military might, nor by political power. In other words, the royal line of David must achieve what it achieves, not by having an army or by gaining political authority, but by the spirit. What a tragedy that the church has often got this wrong with such dreadful episodes as the Crusades. You cannot establish the kingdom of God by military or political power, but only by God's spirit. But the proof that this power was given to Zerubbabel is most unusual. When those building the temple got to the top, the builders held the ceremony of the capstone, that is the last stone, to go on a gable that joins the two sides as they have been built. The text says that Zerubbabel would actually lift that capstone into place with his hands. It is usually quite a heavy stone, but the prophecy says that he would carry it and put it in place single-handed, with no aid, no ropes, no pulleys. We are told, then you will know that I, the Almighty Lord, have sent my prophet to you. Samson carried the gates of the Philistine city away, and now the same Holy Spirit is giving Zerubbabel the power to lift that big stone and get it up. It's an exciting little picture. In his next vision, Zechariah sees two olive trees, which stand for Zerubbabel and Joshua. There is to be a dual leadership. The lampstand speaks of the spirit resting on them both. Zerubbabel is necessary to the future though not as a king. My feeling is that since they were not allowed a king in Persia, they decided to crown the priest, thinking that the Persians couldn't object to a priest, despite the fact that he wasn't really the king. In so doing, they avoided trouble with the Persian Empire. Whether this is the case or not, the temple would be completed in their lifetime, and then they would know that the Lord Almighty had sent Zechariah to them. There was no need to despise the day of small things when looking at the temple compared to Solomon's. A Flying Scroll, Chapter 5, 1 to 4 The scroll is 10 by 5 meters in size and it flies through the air over the land. The words on the scroll read, Curses on all who steal and lie. As it travels over the homes of the people, it hovers when it comes to the house of someone who is stealing or lying. A curse drops from the scroll on the house and the house is destroyed. Zechariah is saying very simply that God will curse whoever has been stealing or telling lies. A woman in a basket. Chapter 5 verse 5 to 11. Zechariah sees a woman who looks like a prostitute in a 35 litre measuring basket. Two women with stork's wings come flying down, pick up the basket in their beaks with a woman in it and fly to the east. This is a picture of God taking their sins away to Babylon. God is saying, I took sinners there. Now I want to take your sin there because that is where it belongs. Babylon, as often in scripture, is the place of sin. Four chariots, chapter 6, 1 to 8. Finally, we have the picture of four chariots with red, black, white and dapple grey horses which go out throughout the whole earth to do God's will. They have already finished their work in the north in Babylon, so one chariot is having a rest. 
but the other three go everywhere in the world to do his will. God has a worldwide control of history. His agents can be sent anywhere speedily. It is at this point that three wise men arrive from Babylon. They were merchants bringing silver and gold as a gift for the temple. But Zechariah was told to take some of it and make a crown and then have a coronation for Joshua in the temple. The refrain comes again. Then you will know that I am the Lord. But this is a crucial point. As I said earlier, the priest and the king were never united in Israel. They had been united in Jerusalem long before the Jews took it in the days of Melchizedek. But now the two are once more combined. But there is a condition attached to this. If my people diligently obey, God is saying he would give them a king again, but not from the royal line of David this time. Joshua was chosen because he was a priest, and so Persia wouldn't think that the leader would be a problem to them. It is a neat device to encourage them to be the kingdom of Israel again, and yet it is not yet the true fulfillment of the promises of the Messiah. Fasting and Feasting Two years later, two men came to Zechariah from Bethel in the north. This suggests incidentally that within two years they had begun to spread out over the old country and were re-establishing other towns in Jerusalem. The men represented a group of people in Bethel who were seeking guidance about their religious life. They came to see a priest but found a prophet. Their questions concern two practices, fasting and feasting, because these were the two practices that they observed as part of their religion. They wanted to ask first of all about the fast they were regularly observing. They had two per year in the fifth and seven months to remember how Jerusalem had been destroyed, to mourn for the loss of the city. They were asking how much longer they were supposed to continue doing this especially now that Jerusalem had been returned to them. Zechariah's answer was interesting. He told them that the fasting was actually a self-centered ritual. They fasted because they were sorry for themselves, sorry that they didn't leave their sins alone. He told them that the kind of fast that God would like by quoting Isaiah 58. They must fast from dishonesty and cruelty and instead be generous and kind and help the helpless and secure the needy. The fast that God really wants does not involve doing without food but doing without sin. This is a relevant word for those who practice Lent but never deal with the sin in their lives. Furthermore, he said that it was precisely for these reasons that the exile came. They had become selfish and greedy instead of being generous and kind. As for the questions about the feast, there had been certain festivals which had been kept up in the exile but were more holidays than holy days. They celebrated these in the 4th, 5th, 7th and 10th months, so that in total there were two fasts and four feasts per year during their time in exile. But once again, Zechariah tells them that their feasts are far too self-centered. They were having a good time with food, friendship and fun. But God was not given the central place of celebration. They should make them truly holy days instead of holidays and be thankful that God had brought them back to the land to praise him. Don't just have a holiday or a bank holiday. Have a celebration of the fact that God has been faithful to you, that you are back in the holy mountain, that the streets are full of young people and elderly people again. Rejoice that God is going to bring more back and repopulate the whole land. That is what you should be doing with your feasts. Zechariah also tells them that they need to be ready for the fact that many more people are going to come to them, because as Jews they know God. He is saying there will come a time when people will come and seize the robe of a Jew and ask him to explain who God is. Future Predictions, chapters 9 to 14. The second half of the book is more complicated because now Zechariah turns away from the present situation and looks into the distant future. 
What he says could fit any time centuries ahead, and it is not in any particular order, rather like a jigsaw with pieces of different shapes and sizes. You don't know where they fit, and without a picture on the lid you are really lost. It reminds me of the beginning of the letter to the Hebrews, where it says God spoke to our fathers in the old days through the prophets in various ways, or in bits and pieces, but now he has spoken to us through his Son. Jesus is the picture on the lid. Through him we can begin to fit all the pieces together and know how it is all going to turn out. This is why the book of Revelation alludes to Zechariah so extensively, because it is able to fit these pieces into the picture of the distant future or the end times, the time when history reaches its final countdown. It is Jesus who will break the seals on the scroll at the countdown of history, and so we have a great advantage over the Jews who read this book but can't see how it comes together. There is a distinct change in style and content in the second half of the book, and for the first time in the prophecy, part of it is written in poetry. There is no mention of the contemporary situation, or the temple, or Joshua, or Zerubbabel. There are no visions, and even God's name changes from the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of heaven's armies, to just Yahweh. It has a totally different feel, so different that some scholars say it must have been someone else who wrote it. Some scholars are very rigid in their ideas, but in fact the second bit is different because God gave it to Zechariah in a different way. These passages are not dated, so we don't know when they were given to him. It may have been years later. As for the content, the prophecies are called oracles. The Hebrew word is literally heavy or weighty, but it's usually translated as oracle, though I don't think that quite conveys the true meaning. It is a heavy burden. If the Lord has given you a heavy burden, you will know what I am talking about. Something is heavy on your heart until you share it, and once you've shared it, it lightens. You know when the burden is delivered. The second half of the book includes two such burdens. One is covered by chapters 9 to 11, and the other by chapters 12 to 14, and they are very different. National Chapters 9 to 11 In chapters 9 to 11, the focus is on the people of Israel. There is no indication as to when these things will happen, or even if they are in the right order. It is interesting that Ephraim is also mentioned. This was the name given to the ten northern tribes, and suggests that they are not forgotten by God, even though they never return from exile in Assyria. There are six pictures that are part of this future, though it is impossible to relate them to each other. Vanquished Enemies, Chapter 9, 1 to 8 The first picture is that Israel's enemies will be vanquished. Syria, Tyre, Sidon and the Philistines all receive specific mention. God will deal with all those who have come against Jerusalem. He will not allow Jerusalem ever to be wiped off the map. It is his city and it's where he has put his name. Therefore, I can guarantee that even if New York, Beijing, Washington DC and New Delhi are wiped off the map, Jerusalem will still be there. There will always be Jewish survivors to be integrated into the land. He even says that some Philistines will join them. Since modern day Palestinians call themselves descendants of the Philistines, it is an intriguing promise and there will come a day when never again will there be an oppressor to run over God's people. It is just a piece of the picture, and we don't know at what date it will be fulfilled. But God keeps his promises even if he waits centuries to do so. A Peaceful King, Chapter 9, 9-10 The second picture is of a king of peace riding to Jerusalem on a donkey. We know how this fits the picture, because Jesus did exactly that, though the tragedy is that when Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, they didn't notice the donkey. They thought he was riding on a donkey because he couldn't get a horse, so they rode completely. 
missed the symbolic message. When Jesus rode in on a donkey, the people waved their palm leaves and threw their coats down, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. It is not a kind of heavenly hello, as some seem to think, but rather it means liberate us now. It is a cry of people who have been oppressed for centuries, but see political autonomy coming near. They even call him son of David in the expectation that he will set them free. But he wasn't coming to fight for them. Had he wanted to come and fight for their liberation, he would have ridden a horse and he, as he will at his second coming. So they received the biggest shock of their lives when he went through the gate in Jerusalem and turned left instead of right. Instead of heading to the fortress, Antonia, where the troops had their headquarters, he grabbed a whip and turned left into the temple where he whipped the Jews out of God's temple. I am not surprised that a few days later they said, you can crucify that man, we prefer the freedom fighter. The big irony of history is that the freedom fighter whom they chose had a most unusual name, Jesus Barabbas, which means Jesus son of the father. So on that day, there were two men called Jesus, son of the father. Pilate said, which Jesus son of the father do you want? The man who won't fight for you or the man who will. They preferred the fighter. But Malachi says that one day this prince of peace will come in judgment. He will bring righteousness and peace and will have dominion from sea to sea. A Mighty God, chapter 9, 11 to chapter 10, verse 7. Here we have a picture of the Lord appearing visibly to fight for Israel. It is a change from the previous picture which depicts peace. We have here a Lord who would come for his flock and be a good shepherd to them, unlike the bad shepherds they have had. The picture includes the glorious description of a redeemed people who will sparkle like jewels in his crown. The next oracle focuses on Greece. It would be centuries before the Greeks would come to conquer the land, headed by the evil Antiochus Epiphanes. He raised the statue of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, slaughtered a pig on the altar and filled the vestries with prostitutes. It was one of the worst periods in history and lasted exactly three and a half years, that is 42 months or 1260 days, which is exactly the period predicted concerning the Antichrist in the New Testament. Under Antiochus Epiphanes, the Jews suffered what Christians will suffer under the Antichrist. It is intriguing that the rise of Greece should be predicted in this third little piece of the picture. We can grasp what is going on now, but it is hard to see what they must have made of it at the time. A gathered people, chapter 10, verse 8 to 12. The next picture is of gathered people, a reversal of the diaspora, with Jews brought from every nation to their land. Indeed, the present day people of Israel have come from over 80 nations, so they have brought the music and dances of 70 nations. This is a picture of the gathered people coming home, and Zacharias says there will not be enough room for them. It even says that a highway will be built between Egypt and Assyria. Deforested Neighbours, chapter 11, 1 to 3. The next picture is a puzzling one. The neighbours of Judah are being deforested. The cedars of Lebanon, the oaks of Transjordan or Bashan, and even the jungle of Jordan. Today, the jungle of Jordan is largely gone and there is just a small area of cedar trees in Lebanon. The oak trees of Bashan have also gone. It is unclear why this oracle is given. Worthless Shepherds, chapter 11, 4 to 17. The picture of worthless shepherds is even more puzzling. It is conveyed by an acted parable with Zechariah taking a job as a foreman shepherd. He has to sack three shepherds for not looking after the sheep. They throw their wages back at him, 
30 pieces of silver. The text says, when the shepherd is smitten, the sheep are scattered. Once again, we have parts of a picture, and yet we can see where they fit in when we read the Gospels. Judas threw his 30 pieces of silver back into the temple because he was a bad shepherd, though he had been both a preacher and a healer. Jesus used the quote of the shepherd being smitten and the sheep being scattered to refer to himself when his disciples fled at his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. The shepherd's staffs are broken, the first favour revoking the covenant that God had made with the nations, and the second union breaking the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. International, chapters 12 to 14. The second series of pictures is international. They show us what will happen on an international basis, with Jerusalem at the heart of the action. On 21 occasions we find the name Jerusalem in this section. It is as if Jerusalem is going to be the focus of the future. This is where the United Nations headquarters will have to be moved to. Here is a picture of Zion as the centre of world government. One phrase is used frequently in this section. On that day occurs 18 times, with day itself another two times though it has not been used before in the prophecy. The word also occurs frequently in the New Testament, especially on the lips of Jesus. This day is not a 24-hour day. The Hebrew word you can mean yom can mean anything from a 24-hour period to a whole era. We use the word day in the same way in English. If I say the day of the horse and cart has gone and the day of the tractor has come, I'm not talking about 24-hour days at all, but about an error. There will come a day of the Lord when the whole world will see that it is God's day, that the day of man's pride and greed is over, that the day of God's holiness is here. Only one section is chapter 13, is poetry, and the word day doesn't appear in that part, interestingly enough. Once again, the order of the prophecies is not in sequence, and chapter 12, verse 3, and 14, verse 2 probably refer to the same event. An Invading Army, chapter 12, 1 to 9. The first is a picture of an international United Nations force attacking Jerusalem. An army gathered from the entire nations of the world is sent to the Middle East. This hasn't happened yet, but it is a piece of the jigsaw. Jerusalem has yet to be attacked in that way, so it is clear that the difficulties that Israel is facing on the international stage will continue. We may live to see this United Nations force sent to attack the Jews. There are very few friends left at the United Nations in America. Their major friend is now beginning to turn against them. Even inhabitants, chapter 12, 10 to 14. The next picture is of grieving inhabitants. There will come a day when the people of Jerusalem are so desperate that they will not try and make peace treaties with Palestinians or anyone else, but will cry to God. God's answer will be to send him whom they pierced, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how the Jews will feel? when they realised that Jesus was their Messiah and they killed him. They will weep as if their eldest son has been murdered. It is Zechariah who first said that the Jews will actually see him whom they pierced. In fact, that very phrase is taken up in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, where we are told that when Jesus comes back, those who pierced him will see him. The only thing needed to convert a Jew is to know that Jesus of Nazareth is alive. That was all it took for Saul of Tarsus, and that is all it takes today. It would be painful for them to look back on 2,000 wasted years, when they could have been leading the world, and yet have been hounded from one country to another, as the book of Deuteronomy said they would be. No wonder they will weep. Banished Prophets, chapter 13, 1 to 6. 
Zechariah has a vivid vision of false prophets. They have been amongst the greatest dangers that Jerusalem ever faced. Jerusalem is going to be cleansed of all such people, along with the idolatry and false gods. It says they will be cleansed of sin and washed from all impurity by a fountain of water. He goes on to talk about Zion being cleansed from sin, and the false prophets then will be so ashamed and so disgraced that they will disown their profession. Prophets with visible wounds, previously seen as a badge of honour, will claim that they were made in a pub brawl. It is a vivid story of people ashamed of giving false teaching. A Reduced Population, Chapter 13, 7 to 9. The next picture is of a reduced population, but this passage is clearly not in order, for here Jerusalem is said to be reduced to one third of its population, while in the next section, Chapter 14, Verse 2, it is reduced to a half. It seems to be a throwback to the text about the shepherd being smitten and the sheep scattered. I am not sure where this fits. It could be future or past. We will have to wait and see. What is clear is that the third who are left will be a remnant refined by God. Plague the Tekkers, chapter 14, verse 1 to 15. In chapter 14 we return to this international attack on Jerusalem. It is not clear whether this is the same attack as in chapter 12, 1 to 8, but I believe this is definitely in the future. God will gather this huge military force, and yet he will also fight for the Jews. It is clearly linked closely to the second coming, and probably to the battle of Armageddon. But here we have the statement, and his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. God hasn't got feet, but Jesus has. And this is interpreted by all Jews as the coming of the Messiah. We are told there will be a great eruption, which will cause amazing geophysical changes to the whole area. I assume we have to take it literally, even though it boggles the imagination. Jerusalem is down in a hollow surrounded by mountains. There are eight peaks around Jerusalem. It is an amazing geometrical landscape. The east face of the Dome of the Rock faces the Mount of Olives. The northeast faces Mount Scorpus. The south faces the Mount of Condemnation. We read that when his feet stand on the Mount of Olives, the peaks will shake and go down and Jerusalem will be left on the peak. Jerusalem will at last be the high place. This is all part of the picture. Our imagination finds it quite difficult to fit it all in, but the main point of this picture is that the United Nations force around the city will be dealt with. Those who have come to attack Jerusalem in the final battle will be held their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths and in panic they will kill each other. Not surprisingly, the people of God will then say the Lord is our God. Universal Worship, chapter 14, verse 16 to 21. Finally, there is a picture of all the nations seeing Jerusalem as the place of God's name, with all the nations of the world observing the Feast of Tabernacles. It is the one feast that Christians ignore. We observe Passover in a sense with Easter. We observe Pentecost with Whit Sunday, but Tabernacles. For the Jew, this is the greatest feast, celebrated in September stroke October. It is their harvest festival. They live in little booths open to the sky so they can see the skies and remember how God brought them through the wilderness. It is an eight-day feast, and the final day is a wedding day. On this day, they get married to the law. There is a wedding canopy, and a rabbi with a scroll of the law of Moses stands under the canopy. They all dance round, and they get married to the law of Moses for another year. They start reading Genesis chapter 1 the next morning, and they read through until they read the last verse in Deuteronomy, 12 months later. 
Then they get married to the law again, but they have got the wrong bridegroom, because the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles looks forward to the marriage supper of the Messiah, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This reminds us that the whole Bible is a romance. It tells how a father found a bride for his son, and it finishes up with them getting married and living happily ever after. All good romances finish with a marriage, and the Bible is no exception. This marriage is on the eighth day of this feast, referred to in Revelation as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. The clues are all there in Luke's Gospel. He was born in September or early October, in the seventh month, the month of the Feast of Tabernacles. We read in John's opening chapter that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. In John 7, Jesus' brother sarcastically asked him whether he was attending the Feast of Tabernacles, because that is when they were expecting the Messiah. They didn't believe in him, and they were teasing him. But he said, My time has not yet come. Therefore, of one thing I feel quite sure, I know the month when Jesus will come back. I don't know the year, but he must come back on time. It will be during the Feast of Tabernacles. Indeed, many Jews believe that the Messiah will come during the Feast of Tabernacles on the basis of Zechariah 14. From then on, nations will celebrate the feast annually and will send representatives to Jerusalem. We are told that if they don't attend, their country will get no rain. So the Feast of Tabernacles has become for Jews and now for an increasing number of Christians a focal point of the hope for a universal reign of the Messiah over the whole world. Christian Fulfillment Having looked at the pieces of the jigsaw, we must now build the picture. We must remember that what the prophet saw may bear no relation to the timing of events. Things that looked close to one another may well be hundreds or thousands of years apart. It is clear that many of the events described refer to the two comings of Jesus Christ. The first coming. Jesus was born at the Feast of Tabernacles. He came to Jerusalem for the last time riding on a donkey. He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And when the disciples fled at the trial of Jesus, the Gospel writers quoted the verse, When the shepherd was struck, the sheep were scattered. The second come in. There is a close link with the book of Revelation. We are told that the feet of Jesus will stand on the Mount of Olives. There are strong indications that his return will be at the Feast of Tabernacles. Revelation reminds us that when Jesus comes again, the Jewish nation will look upon him whom they pierced. Unfulfilled Prophecy Zechariah, along with other Old Testament prophecies, contains predictions that have not been fulfilled. The chart below gives the three broad explanations for this, on page 755. Conditional. Some say that the fulfillment was dependent upon the obedience of Israel. The key word was if. Since Israel was disobedient, the prophecies are obsolete and are never going to be fulfilled. Hence there is no point in studying them because they are of no relevance today. Unconditional. Others see the prophecies as fulfilled in the church. They see them fulfilled spiritually, so the church is a new Israel, victorious now and participating in the victories predicted for Israel. The problem with this view is that while the blessings are applied to the church, the curses are not. So there is a failure in logic. Either both blessings and curses apply to the church or neither do. Others are expecting that the prophecies will be fulfilled in the future. Romans 11 speaks of a revival among the Jews prior to the second coming. In this view, 
the survivors of the tribulation will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in the Millennial Kingdom, when Jesus reigns over all nations from Jerusalem. Beyond that time, there will be a new Jerusalem, with the twelve tribes and twelve apostles prominent. My opinion is that the prophecies not yet fulfilled will literally come true. It may not be clear exactly how it all fits together, but we do know enough to be clear about the basics, and we can be sure that God has a purpose for the whole world, and it is going to happen. Jesus is coming back to reign, and we shall reign with him. In that sense, the book of Zechariah does not end on a note of sadness, with a failure of the Jews to respond, as some suppose, but with a note of hope that one day God will do all that he has promised.